Awesome. Okay. I think I'm screen sharing, but I can't see my own face. So I'm just going to presume that y'all see me. Um, yep. I have most of this written down on paper because tactile and uh, it's just the preferred method. The slideshow is going to serve a lot more as a backup. Um, but don't feel like you have to look at my face. You don't completely optional as well. So hello, hello. Sabuta and welcome. My name is Renatoris Folson, also known as Renatoris Um, I've been a Gaulish polytheist for coming up on two years and a practicing polytheist for almost five. Um, I'm a member of the Gaulish tradition, uh, Montelon Bolgon, um, the tradition of the Belge. I am also a member of Sapano Realty, um, the Summer Sworn. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as an order of uh, Gallo Britonic do gooders who follow and are inspired by Tyrannus. Um, I myself identify as an Alemannic polytheist, which means that my religious practice is based on and informed by the Alemanni. Uh, those were a loose confederacy of various Germanic, Gallo Roman, um, Gallo Germanic, and Gaulish tribes who were all. Romanized to varying different degrees. Um, what tied them together is that they all inhabited the same area and that they actually developed a identifiable culture um, from there on out, somewhere around the fourth century uh, common era. Uh, the Romans raged, uh, waged war with and traded with their Gaulish and German neighbors, but also conscripted them into military service. Uh, the Germanoi and the Gauls waged war on one another all the time, constant raidings. Um, but they did also enjoy times of cohabitation, uh, marriages, melding, blending. Gauls were Germanized, Germanoi were Celtified. So there was a lot of cultural exchange near the Rhine. The Rhine was a, a hotbed of exchange, um, even before Julius Caesar had decided that the Rhine was going to be this grand cultural border. It had always been a sort of mixing pot. And once the Romans moved up there, um, it became what a lot of... Uh, people are now terming frontier Gaul. And so it added a unique culture that was uh, military focused. Um, so while examining my chosen path from all three angles, you know, continental Celtic, continental Germanic and frontier Roman, I repeatedly brushed up against a common theme and that was of a Rhineland river God. Interestingly, this God seems to have been worshiped in a similar capacity and a similar role by the roles, uh, by the Gauls, Roman, and the uh, Germans, Germanoi, um, within the Rhineland frontier. Um, what at first I thought was going to be a real simple open and close case um, about, you know, the god of the Rhine turned out to be a much, much deeper dive. And so in this presentation, I want to talk about the development of the cult of Rhinus Pater, um, where it stems from, where it's going, possible interpretations, themes and iterations, what, do you have met, what he might have meant in a Rhineland context, how he interacts with modern polytheists today. Um, yeah, so welcome. Uh, first things first, again, I, this is a reconstruction, but I have to admit that I'm doing very little heavy lifting. I'm doing a lot of stitching together. A lot of these themes are already present. A lot of this information is readily available. It's just that the sources are sometimes obscured behind academic German journals or far off uh, poetry. And so my goal here is less to present you with a theoretical uh, Reynas Pater and more so to pick um, the cult of Reynas Pater up out of the dirt, brush it off and present for your consideration. So think of this as an introduction. So off we go. So, uh, yep, that's going to be our breakdown. We're going to, uh, a little bit of an intro, which you just witnessed. We're going to do etymology, attestations, imagery. Then who is Reynas Pater? We're going to try and pinpoint roles, origin, and different cognates um, from other Proto-Indo-European cultures, as well as neighboring cultures. And then we're going to talk about the role within my praxis. Um, this is going to be a pretty long presentation. So if there's time, we're going to end up doing a ritual as well. So that's me. Um, you may recognize me by this picture, which is my go-to imagery on pretty much any social media um, present on TikTok, um, Discord, and uh, Reddit. So you may have seen me about. That's me. That's the picture I use pretty much all the time. So 
Etymology. So Rhenus Pater is Latin for Rhine father. The root of Rhenus is Proto-Indo-European coming from re, meaning moving, flowing, rushing forward, springing forth. Um, it's shared um, with other words um, in languages that have evolved from it, such as run in English or the French derive, so to spring forth from, to descend. Uh, many other river names, including the re root, um, are the Reno in Italy or the Rio Grande in Mexico. Um, Rhenus itself stems from Proto-Celtic Rhinos, which later became Gaulish Renos. Uh, the name was adopted into Proto-Germanic as a Rhinos, which would later become Rin in Old High German and Old Franconian. And then the last syllable was dropped in Alemannic. It became Re. An interesting side note that we're going to circle back to is that within Proto-Celtic, the grammatical name of Rhenus is inherently masculine. And it remains this way when it's adopted into Latin, Greek, Proto-Germanic. And this is traditionally not the case with many river deities, especially within a uh, Proto-Celtic language context where they were often grammatically female, you know, with a few exceptions. Um, all right. And yeah, and the, oh, we just saw a post of someone saying they love the artwork. It should be, oh, see if I can go back, but I will post a link to the artist. They're phenomenal. Um, so the Potter suffix, uh, I don't even know how to go back. Forgive me. I assume this. Oh, we, nice. The Potter suffix, which is Latin for father, is added to the name, um, which is actually a common convention for a lot of Roman river gods um, and Roman gods in general, such as Dispotter. But it's incredibly common among a group of gods called the Potamoi in Greek or their Roman cognates, uh, the Flumina. Uh, we're going to talk the, about them in a second. Uh, the naming convention of Rhenus Pater, Rhine Father, is still present in many important rivers that were once grouped among the Potamoi, such as uh, Father Danube and Father Thames. The, it is clear that Rhenus, the river, and Rhenus Pater, the god, were connected and therefore inseparable. So the real question that we arrive at is the river named after the god or the god named after the river? It's complex, but my stance is probably a little bit of both. The existence of a Reno River, which would be the direct Latinization of the Gaulish word uh, Reno, uh, whereas Reynus is a direct adaptation of the Greek word into Latin. So I have a little bit of a breakdown there. Um, as you can see, Reynos directly into Latin would become Reno, um, but Reynos into Greek, Reynos, and then into Reynus does one more extra step. The fact that both of those are translated from the same original word um, leads me to believe that the rivers themselves may have been named after the god, but the possibility also exists that the Reno was simply named after Rhenus. So there's no definitive thing there. Um, my opinion is that Rhenus does refer to a river as well as the god, and the two are inseparable, as is the nature with animism. Um, within the Greek school of thought, Rhenus is the Rhine River, but not just in a physical sense, but a metaphysical sense as well. Rhenus is not tethered to the place of the Rhine River. Instead, the river is a mundane reflection of his shape in the cosmos. Just as Drus is the world's tree, but also the world, so Rhenus Pater is both the river and the god in this world and the other world. So, attestation, a name carved in stone. These uh, translations are all incredibly new, very up to date. They were done just earlier this year by uh, Viticus, our dear friend, Deo Mercurio. Um, he is seriously the best when it comes to Latin inscriptions and my Latin being virtually non-existent, um, he did clue me into some of the things here. Um, so, there's a common saying amongst those who study uh, Roman religion when it comes to what deities, uh, their enemies, um, were used purely as political or social propaganda. And it, what, I'm, what I mean by that is within a Roman context, some rivers um, were depicted purely as uh, iconography. They were used as state propaganda. So if Rome conquered a certain people, they would 
erect statues of this river being conquered by them as a show of state dominance. There is, however, a little bit of a uh, kind of a way to stress test that, the way to find out whether a river god um, was really worshipped as a deity, there have to be three criteria that are met. Um, and the first is votive inscriptions. Luckily, of those, we have quite a few. So Renus Pater comes to us from exactly five inscriptions. I'm going to leave the Latin up there um, for anyone who wants to read it. I myself will not be bothering with it because I don't want to butcher that language even more than I already would. Um, but you know, they read uh, Augustus, uh, the provincial governor, dedicated this. The second one reads, uh, to the river Rhine for the well-being of Q. Um, the third one is, to Jupiter, best and greatest, uh, so the state religion Jupiter, and the genus Loki, the spirit of this place, and the Rhine, Claudius Marcellinus, a soldier in the favor of the consul, readily and duly fulfills his vow during the sixth consulship of the emperor Commodus. And for our fourth one, we have Jupiter, best and greatest. Again, that's the state Jupiter, the ancestral gods and those who preside over this place, the ocean and the Rhine, Quintus Marcus Genialis, the Legatus Legionis of the 30th Legion, Ulpa Victrix, for his own well being and those of his family and friends, readily and duly fulfills his vow. Um, the last one, again, is in honor of the divine house, the imperial family, family Jupiter, best and greatest to the genus of the place, to Neptune, to ocean, and to the and to all gods and goddesses for the well-being of Lord Marcus Aurelius Antonius, the pious and fortunate son of divine Antonius the Great, son of the divine Severus, and it goes on. Um, what's interesting about uh, all of these votive stones is that they are all carved by Roman citizens um, serving as soldiers on the Roman frontier. Again, that's where we get with that Roman Gaulish frontier culture. Um, he's commonly invoked after the state godhood, uh, Jupiter, um, all after uh, Poseidon, Neptune, um, and the genus Loki. Um, this can be interpreted as the Romans who carved this inscription, placing Rhenus in a hierarchy below their gods, but first among uh, native gods and spirits of the place. Um, a lot of these are in order to fulfill a vow. They were written, so I fulfilled this vow, here's a dedication. And those that are not, or even some that are, are for health and protection. And this can already clue us in to quite a few of the functions for Rhenus. Um, Rhenus Pater is also attested by Orvid and Tacitus. Orvid describes him in poetry. And when Tacitus speaks of the Batavian revolt, um, he mentions that the Rhine is countered under the Germanic gods. So we see that it was not just limited to Romans, Gauls, and German, or, or Germans, but instead, everyone seemed to worship the Rhine. Now, we don't know if every single person had the same interpretation of the Rhine until we get a little bit later in the presentation, and hopefully I'll be able to shed some light on that. Um, there is a suspected Germanic inscription uh, for Requas, um, which some people believe is the uh, Romanization of the uh, Germanic Requalia, um, which would be uh, made up of the uh, Germanic root uh, for darkness as well as water. So requas could end up meaning the dark one or the dark waters. And this inscription was found um, by the Rhine River. So that could possibly be, but I wouldn't stake too much on it. Um, now the second proof of worship, as we talked about, the first being inscriptions. The second is minting and coinage. And I'm going to go ahead and show them. Rhenus was actually printed on two separate coins. Uh, the most common minting thereof is that first one you're going to see in the top left. That's Rhenus under heel by Cesterius. And they were minted quite a bit. And you see um, the individual um, that it was minted for placing his foot um, upon a uh, reclined Rhenus, which is a very, very normal um, position for him to take. Uh, so he's placing his foot upon him, showing the Roman dominance over the river. And this was minted in the year 87. Uh, a little bit later, we also have uh, the Rhine reclining um, by Posthumus. Now, Posthumus was a Gallo-Roman uh, usurper who actually ended up breaking off of the Roman Empire due to various political and uh, military infightings. And he ended up uh, creating his own um, Gallic uh, empire, which lasted for right about 
I think, 10 years, possibly longer, um, until he was eventually killed in an uprising. But here we see Rhaenys depicted as a god on the backside and not in a diminutive or conquered form, but celebratory, which would make sense if uh, Posthumus had both Gaulish and German her uh, Germanic heritage. Um, that one was only minted twice um, in two neighboring locations. Um, it was actually towards the end of Posthumus's rule, so the funds were running a little bit low, it was a little bit harder in his new Gallic Empire, but I do count myself fortunate enough to own one of those, and that is of the second minting, where Rhaenys is depicted with horns, whereas in his first one, he is depicted without horns. Um, on the bottom, I have a picture of a couple other, ooh, I have a picture of a couple other river gods, and we see that there uh, is a common motif of them uh, being depicted, which we'll go over in a little bit. So the third criteria, after inscriptions and after coinage, is offerings, votive offerings. And of those, we have no doubt because we have plenty. Um, so we see that there is a uh, shield, which was found right next to one of the uh, inscriptions. And that's noting it's not a full shield. It's a shield boss or whatever the technical Latin term for that is, um, which bears imagery of the eagle, the bull, um, reclining individuals. It does evoke a lot of imagery of the river gods. Uh, it is unknown whether this was made specifically for that, but it was indeed left there as a votive offering. Um, in the middle to the left, we see a lot of Alemannic. Um, grave goods such as helmets, swords, arrows, um, and you see with some of the swords uh, in the full picture, which I'll post later, that those are actually in a, uh, a Celtic style, so a continental Celtic style. There's a lot of material culture overlap between the Alemanni and their Gaulish predecessors just a couple of years beforehand. Um, we also see here a bunch of uh, votive things all throughout the year. Uh, throughout the years, some of them dated to around 800. We got coins, we've got bells, we've got tablets. And then on the far right um, is actually a Roman offering, um, which we found. Uh, this is a scabbard nicknamed the, sh uh, the Sword of Tiberius, which was found bent and mangled in the Rhine River and is interpreted to be a votive offering piece. Now, the brief thing we have to talk about before we go any further in imagery is that according to, well, let me rephrase, we have to go into is that a lot of the imagery that is typical of Renus Pater is not exclusive to him. A lot of this imagery is actually a direct carryover of a Greek river god cult. And in this cult, the river gods together are grouped and labeled as Potamoi. Um, according to the myths, they were born of Oceanus and Tethys, a number of children who gave their names to rivers. Within a, a Greek context, the uh, Potamoi were a group of male river gods. Um, they were brothers to the Oceanids, um, which I'm probably butchering, which would be uh, female water deities. Um, and they all descended from, but were also a physical part of Oceanus, um, who in original incarnation was not the ruler of the ocean, but instead a river that encircled the world. And again, this is from a Greek context, but we'll see just how much of that carried over. Um, the Potamoi were fathers to all sorts of rivers, merfolk, um, mermaids, sirens, but also to mortal men. Uh, they were labeled strong and masculine, often uh, full-bearded or nude, or at least bare-chested. Um, they were sometimes depicted as their literal river shape, but sometimes young men, sometimes bulls, and as you see in that picture up in the back in the middle, sometimes a little bit of all of the above. Um, what's interesting is that they share all of these qualities with their father. So Oceanus is depicted almost the same as the Potamoi are uh, within Greek art. Oceanus does have a lot more snake connotations as well, which is shared by some of the Potamoi, like um, the one that Hercules wrestles, which I'm scared to pronounce because I don't want to butcher that name. But that seems to fade away the further up north you get. There seems to be less and less snake iconography. Um, sometimes man, 
sometimes a bull man or even mermen with horns. Um, what is typical of the Potomoy is this one particular image, a man reclined his elbow on an urn, amphorae or jug out of which spills water. The Potomoy themselves often hold an oar or a staff or reeds, um, sometimes swords, sometimes tridents, but most oftenly it's an oar or a staff. Um, now there's no secret that there's a direct through line from the Greek world to that of ancient Rome. Just as the Anemoi, which are the spirits of air, became the Ventus, the Potomoy became the Flumina, where they kept most of their imagery and iconography. The only thing worth noting is that a lot of them were depicted aged up a little bit. So instead of the more uh, fresh-faced, short-bearded men, the man in the middle, they would be depicted more as either one on to his left or right with a bit more of a longer beard and full head of hair. Um, we can see from inscriptions and minting that Rhenus Pater embodies the most archetypal imagery of the Potomoy and Flumina, including a reclined pose and an urn from which water spills forth. During later European Romantic periods, Rhenus is sometimes depicted with a crown of poplars, reeds, or grapevines all around his head. Um, this is a reference to the fact that the Rhine directly feeds a lot of Germany and Switzerland's wineries where white grapes for white wine are grown. Um, this also gives us kind of a clue onto how Rhenus might have been perceived as a god of fertility of the land, or just that he may have had certain aspects thereof. Um, Rhenus, like many of the Potomoi, seems to retain the horns of, his, of a bull, even in human shape. Um, in fact, they're so emblematic of him, this is how he was described first and foremost. While other Potomoi have these as well, Rhenus is identified almost exclusively by his horns in human shape. Ovid goes so far as to call him Rhenus with the broken horns when talking about um, the visual sign of the subjugation of the river by the Roman Empire. Um, another signature look of, the, of Rhenus is found that he has a constantly open mouth. Scholars are confident that this image of a mouth agape uh, mimics the urn he commonly holds and may resemble water pouring forth. So I have a uh, an idol right here depicted in the more classical uh, Potomoy shape. But let's say if you were either a less skilled artist or you had less time and you still wanted to communicate the vibe, I have now um, an idol that I've made myself right here. You could either opt for a head and an urn, but what is most common would be just the head like this with the open mouth to still symbolize the water pouring forth and to give a clue to the identity as well as the horns. So the bull is a sacred image within the Proto-Indo-European context, which I'm sure we're all familiar with due to its high statue and valued goods associated with him. This animal oftentimes symbolizes sacrifice and holiness. Um, but next we are going to talk about um, our guys right here. So the images of Rhenus Pater and what he may be uh, tied to. We have the votive offerings in the river. Um, we have the Eridanus constellation, which we'll circle back to. Uh, rivers to the underworld, wine and vineyards, the bull imagery, the Potomoy imagery, and the horns and open mouth are the big ones. I highlighted them in red for you. Um, uh, also riches and gold, fish and nourishment. Um, of the fish, one of the biggest identifiers would be the trout, um, because the trout is the most common and most abundant fish in the Rhine River. And to this day, um, even in Switzerland, the most dependable source of fish is actually river trout, which comes directly from the Rhine. And it was probably that way in ancient times too. So the trout is a huge animal symbol of uh, Rhenus. I would also extend this to other fish that could be caught in the Rhine and that would serve a similar function. So the trout, um, the salmon, and probably also sturgeon, because all of those serve similar functions within the Rhine and would have been viewed as a similar food source. This also reinforces Rhenus's role as a god of plenty and a god of nourishment. Um, he also has associations, um, like we mentioned, with the bull. Um, 
Uh, there are many folk tales where a bull escapes from a river or uh, a pond and must then be wrangled by townsfolk or mermen and coaxed back into the pond or river. Um, there's no direct ties of this to Rainus, but thematically it fits very well. So, yeah. So I've thrown a lot of imagery around. Um, Rainus in, in particular to the Potomoy seems to retain the horns of a bull, even while in human shape. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Give <laughs> me two seconds. Oh, oh, there we go. That's why. So other animal imageries would be that of the crane and that of the stork. Um, while these are not historically attested, they don't appear in Gaulish or Germanic art, they're very, very common in a modern context. Um, so, oh, give me one second, I'm getting a visitor. What do you need, babe? Okay, two seconds, I'll be right back. Um, that was my, th that was my three-year-old. Um, and, uh, when parenthood calls. <laughs> so like I said, the crane and the stork, they're not historically attested, but within a modern context, they're almost a signature. Um, you will be very, very hard pressed to find any sort of tourism merchandise or imagery or postcards of the Rhine that does not feature a stork or a crane. So in that regard, those I would extend um, those to be images of Rainus as well. So We've talked a lot about the imagery, a lot about the history behind this, and uh, now we're going to get to the most difficult, but also my favorite part of this presentation. So, who is Rainus Pater in search of cognates? Um, we're going to go over a few other identifications, and I'll explain my logic behind this. By examining other river gods belonging to the Potomoy and Flumina grouping, we can discover quite a lot a bit about, about Rainus Pater. Through imagery alone, we can prove that Rhenus Pater was counted among the Flumina. So if Reno or Rhenus was the Roman designation for the god, we've discussed that Rhenus was the Latinized Greek name for the Gaulish word. But it bears noting something, that both of these names, both the Greek into Latin and the straight Latin translation, were given um, to Rhenus by the Romans. According to Hesiod's Theogony, there are over 3,000 Potomoi, and this isn't even a literal figure. This is used to uh, poetically illustrate just how many of these river gods there are. Um, among them, we find the Ganges, the Po River, the Nile, countless others. And it is also known that the Gauls had a great admiration for and cultural exchange with Greece back in the, since all the way back to Mycenaean times. As such, we can safely assume that if a cognate of Rhenus Pater is to be found among the Greeks, that he may be either a direct cognate or at least a very similar god that shares features and qualities. So I'm going to lead off with a bit of a primer going back to the Potomoy. Tethys bore to Oceanus, the swirling Potomoy rivers, Nilos, the Nile, Alpheus, deep eddying Eridanus, Styrimon, Myandros, Istros of the beautiful waters, Faces and Rhesos, and silver swirling Achelus, Nessus and Rhodius, Hepatus, Haclamon, Grecinus, Asiopos, etc., etc. She brought forth a race apart from daughters, um, who with Lord Apollon and the Potomoy have the young in their keeping all over the earth, since this is the right from Zeus. There are 3,000 Okeanites, and as many again are the rest of the Potomoy rivers, murmurously running the sons of Oceanus and the lady Tethys with their mother. And it would be hard for mortal men to tell the names of all of them, but each is known by those who live by him. While the religion of the Roman Empire was heavily influenced by that of the Greeks, to state it was a simple copy-paste job is not only incorrect, but demonstrates a terrible comprehension of how Roman religious society functioned. Zeus is a cognate of Jupiter, in that he is the closest thing, just as the Potomoi are the closest thing to the Flumina. So who is the closest thing 
to Rhenus pater. Now, before we get any deeper into it, Rhenus draws parallels with another notable flumina, who we are going to use as an example for this. And that would be Danubius. Both of these major rivers in Europe start near miles from another, with the Rhine flowing south to north and the, and the Danube flowing east to west. Both Danubius and Rhenus are depicted nearly identically with the uh, typical Potomoy style. Uh, both of them are men with bull horns, and like Rhenus, his most highlighted features are his horns. He is oftentimes called the Longhorned God, um, which draws parallel to Rhenus's Broken Horned God. He is likely the river god depicted in the Trajan Column due to the event depicted, even his signature horn, even though his signature horns are missing. Um, we're going to get to the Trajan Column a little bit later, but it essentially shows the passing and conquering of a Roman legion over the Danube River. Um, there is a scholar, uh, Kovacs, he writes that, like we can glean from the Rhenus Pater inscriptions, some of Danubius's chief functions were in revenge and the upkeeping of oaths. We only have three inscriptions of Danubius, but all three of them are about the keeping of oaths. In his essay, Deities in Trajan's and Marcellus Aurelius's Column, Peter Kovacs successfully identifies Danubius with another river god, Ister. According to Kovacs, the two names were used at the same time as identified by Strabo. Not only did they share the same functions, but they were used to refer to the same river, the Danubes. While the Greeks called this river Ister and the Romans Danube, he was called Danubius in reference to the upper Danube and Ister in reference to the lower Danube. Ister also had a city named after him, Histeros. In the minting of the city's coin under Roman rule, Ister appears in the shape of Danubius and is even labeled as such, though the imagery remains identical. Even the same printing is used. Um, another connection is that the Thracians, who were neighbors and also lived around uh, the Danube, used both names as well. Um, up here we can see a, a Thracian coin where the imagery seems different, but the name Ister becomes Istros in Thracian, and Danubius becomes Danaris in Thracian, showing that all the people that lived around there at the same time used these names and words interchangeably. Now, the it's not a traditional case of different cultures worshiping gods of similar domains, but instead multiple cultures identifying the same god. This is one of the strongest cases of Interpretatio Romano and Interpretatio uh, Indigenica happening at the same time. Um, now I know what you're thinking. So how does Istris relate to Rhenus Pater? Um, there's some connection. Um, a variation of Istris is used by Tacitus in his piece Germania. According to Tacitus, the three major Germanic tribes are all descended from Manu's three most prominent sons, who are all gods. We find references within their alleged tribal names as to which gods each, each tribe claimed descent from. The landlocked Irminions, the Jutlandish and coastal Ingavones, and the Gallo-Germanic tribes that live within the Rhine valleys, the Istavones. Now, could this point towards Istros as a generic river name? Does that mean that Danube and the, Rhine, the, Danube and the Rhine River were identified as the same? Um, could it be a simple confusion on the author's case? This is no uh, direct yes or no to any of these questions, but there is some similarity between the two of them. And we're going to use this as well as um, Istros and Danubius being the same god in order to illustrate and to find our cognate for the Rhine. So strangely, the father of the Istavones is largely absent. Tarkata does, does, however, note that their name means from in and around the Rhine River. If the river within the Istavones, if the river within Istavones is the same as their progenitor's name, Ister Istros, that could be, but in this context, it's used to identify the Rhine. So although the idea of the Potomoy being separate deities has a bit of an unusual spin, um, 
the, they were oftentimes said to be able to merge, to increase their power. And this would not form new deities, but instead would make the two deities the same and they could freely split later on. Um, just like how if you take a cup of water out of a bathtub, it's not the same water, but it's easily unitable again. So the definition of them was a little bit loose because they were still rivers as well as gods. Um, so they were capable of blending together and coming apart. And as of the reign of Charlemagne in 793, the Rhine and Danube have been connected via waterways. So there is some connection there to that as well. But I'm not stating them a case of reductionist, that this is the same deity. Instead, there's one more layer I want to add to the relationship between Danubius in relation to Renus Pater. Both of these flumina are identified with the same Greek potomoi, Eridanus. Herodotus suspects the word Eridanus to be essentially Greek in character and notably forged by some unknown poet. He does express his disbelief in the whole concept. Um, he's not even sure that uh, Eridanus as a real river exists. Apparently, it started in the south and flowed up to the North Sea, where it met up with the Amber and the Tin Isles. Eridanus, within Greek myth, is a god of, and also the mythological river present within the underworld, but also a physical river that runs from the heartland of Europe all the way up to the theoretical continent that he thought existed at the time, Hyperborea. Um, he is also the constellation in the stars. At all, he is all three at the same time, the river in the underworld, the physical river, and the constellation. Now, Eridanus has been identified at different points in time with various different European rivers. It's been identified with the Don, uh, the Po, Ister, Danube, uh, the Rhone, and the Rhine. I'll talk a little bit about why the Rhine makes the most sense for this. So, Eridanus and Danubius are equated because of their similar names. Um, in fact, it's theorized that Danube was probably identified with Eridanus by the Greeks of old, and particular, uh, particularly because it played a similar role in the conflict of the Scythians and the Greeks, um, as the Rhine would later for the Germans and Romans. It served as a kind of barrier, um, a cultural and uh, empirical line that was difficult for either side to cross over. Um, Eridanus's connection to Rhenus is based within a mythological and geographical framework because they are, there is no linguistic connection to bind the two. Um, he is the brother of other famous ri rivers such as the Styx, um, and that's talking about Eridanus, and there's a lot of river names being thrown around, but Eridanus is the brother to the river Styx. Um, Within a Hellenistic context, Eridanus is one of the sons of Oceanus, the river that encircles the world, just like all Potomoi. Um, now, the reason that I feel confident in identifying uh, the Rhine with Eridanus is that Eridanus is described as such. Um, the river Eridanus also laments emerging from his eddying stream and offers his bottom to receive Pethion. Um, we'll dive more into the myth of Pethion in a little bit. Um, but he soon will harvest the tears of the Helides, um, which is also known as amber, for the breeze and the chills which it exhales will turn into stone the teardrops of the poplar trees, and it will catch them as they fall and conduct them through its bright waters to the barbarians by Oceanus. So, what that's essentially telling us is that the identification of Eridanus is tied to amber and also a flowing from south to north up to barbarian lands. The only other large river that flows north to south within a Celtic or Germanic, because the Germanics back then were also labeled as Celts, remember we're dealing with the Greeks, um, would be the Elbe. But the Elbe River is not grammatically male in any language. Therefore, it can be safely assumed that she would be excluded from being considered as one of the Potomoi, and therefore couldn't be Eridanus. Um, Herodotus claims 
that the Eridanus flowing south to north all the way up to the Tin Isles and Amber Isles. Um, however, like we said earlier, he was a little bit skeptical of the claim. However, recently, um, people have started to put a lot more stock in identifying the Amber and Tin Isles. De Bear and Rogers Dion have successfully identified the source of the Isles, or at least so they believe. Um, I'm going to move on to the, oh, no, there's Eridanus. Good, perfect. So I'm going to move on to the identification of the Isles. Um, before the estuary of Lourdes became silted up in late Roman times, the Bay of Biscay led into a wide gulf, now represented by the lower reaches of the River Brevet in the marshes of the Brere. So what that's essentially saying is that right up here, and you can see in my beautiful MS Paint art um, in the uh, top right image, that the waters were a lot lower at that time uh, in France. And instead of that being solid land, that was very, very marshy, where a lot of islands were present. These islands were tin uh, workshops. So they were just absolutely speckled with tin. And that's where tin was harvested um, and worked into usable goods. Um, another thing that he's identified by is the trade and the acquisition of amber which we see right here mostly comes from the Baltic coast, which is also readily and easily accessible by the Rhine River because that little uh, peninsula up there has several straight through flowing rivers. And the Rhine River, the Delta of the Rhine River has been a historic trade center for years. So while there may have been other trade routes um, to deliver both tin and amber, via the Rhine River would have been the best option to deliver both amber and tin at the same time, which ties into what Herodotus was saying, that the Rhine, that the Eridanus delivers supposedly tin and amber. Um, while other trading routes were established by the time of the Roman Empire, um, it became more difficult to pinpoint Eridanus. Um, because by the time of the Romans, as you'll see in the bottom left, um, the amber trade was largely uh, land and inland river based instead of there being direct connections and larger trading posts. We do know, however, that the we do know, however, that the Gauls in the uh, Rhine River Delta had set up uh, trading hubs there for a long time and they persisted for hundreds of years later, which is why the Phrygians had such a strong trade chokehold up until about a thousand years on most North Sea trade. I think um, with this both mundane and metaphysical explanation, it's we can safely assume that Rhenus is either the direct cognate of Eridanus or the same god under another name. And the reason I say this is because of the myth of Pathion, which I did say we would circle back around to, so you got me, here we are. Um, so the possibility that these are all localized versions of Eridanus, similar to other gods that receive local cults where names and epithets might change, does exist, but because of Gaul's constant and consistent cultural exchange with Greece that has gone back, again, as far as the Mycenaean era, I think it is far more likely that Eridanus is in fact the Greek adaptation of the Gaulish god. And though I make no definite statements, I feel passionately about this. This kind of thing has happened before. Some scholars suggest a continental Celtic origin for uh, the Mycenaean version of Poseidon, you know, Earth Shaker Poseidon. However, that's going to be a whole other presentation in itself. Um, but anyway, the myth of Pathian goes as follows. You know, Pathian hijacks Apollo's uh, chariot. He's riding it through the sky and Zeus enraged by this flings a uh, lightning bolt. Now, I'm grossly oversimplifying. Pathion is struck by the lightning bolt and plummets down into Eridanus. Eridanus, as mentioned before, receives Pathion in open arms, and Pathion, burning and on fire, lands inside Eridanus, Eridanus the river, but also the god. And with fiery flame, the fi uh, with the water extinguishes the fiery flame of Pathion, 
and he passes. His sisters turn to trees and lament, their tears turning into amber. Pathian is lit, is lit on fire and evaporates into the skies. That is the explanation for why Eridanus is, the con is now a constellation. However, Eridanus does not stay in the sky. And this is where the next one's in. The story continues. I will drag him down from heaven, the fiery Eridanus, whose course is among the stars, and bring him back to a new home in the Celtic land. He shall be water again, and the sky shall be bare of the river of fire. So, you shall be reborn in a Celtic land. That sounds pretty self-explanatory. I think that this myth um, is a explanation of why the location of Eridanus changes and why he has been identified with other rivers containing Potomoy and Flumina and why there is no definite saying on which one he is. But because of the geographic evidence and now the relocation, the running from south to north into barbarian or Gaulish lands, I feel confident that we can say Eridanus and Rhenus Pater are simply regional cognates. Now, um, thanks to the vague but present hints of the ancient world, um, we're able to cast a much wider net when it comes to Rhenus Pater instead of just the god of the Rhine. Um, within the Rhine, established as Eridanus and Istros Danube, being a possible cognate or perhaps a similar god, sometimes identified as the same one, it may point towards an overarching Eastern Gaulish river god that was interpreted by and then adopted and incorporated into the mythology of the Greeks. Aspects of him informed other river gods, such as Earthshaker Poseidon and Achaeolus, Later, as the Germanoi moved further south, they too began worshiping the river god as an adaptation of their continental Celtic neighbors. We know that the Germanoi did this. That's evidence from um, the Germanoi adopting the torque, uh, the carnates, and even pants from their Gaulish neighbors. Um, why not a river god that was present? This would not only help reinforce trade, but also tie them together. Um, it's a uh, imitation of themes thereof. Um, a German cognate that arises out of this could be Reykjavaz that we talked about earlier, though that is shaky. Um, later on, the Romans, in their conquest of Gaul, rediscovered the Rhine, and they immediately took him into their fold. We see this as the Rhine being the most, um, the Rhine being the most revered and worshipped by the Romans. Um, in their con uh, little did they know, though, the Romans, that they were in fact identifying and synchronizing Rhenus with the very god that inspired the myth that they were synchronizing him with in the first place. So we come full circle. Now, with the stage set and all of that rambling out of the way, thank you for bearing with me. Um, we can now talk a lot more confidently about the different functions of Eridanus and Rhenus. So, comparison between the Rhine River shape and Eridanus, that's just a little thing to drive the nail home. As you can see, if topical geography was anyone's specialty back then, they might have reached this conclusion, but domains. So there are three primary functions which I stumbled across, and these are broad and they may vary. Um, but Rhenus Pater as a uh, god of the underworld, as a tutelary god, and as a god of sacred oaths and oath keeping. So the otherworldly imagery of the bull, the inherent chthonic uh, ties with water, uh, which is present in a lot of different uh, insular and continental Celtic cultures, the association to wine, and now the association with urns leads us to Rhenus Rainer, uh, Pater's first primary function that of the Chthonic underworld god and patron of the dead. Um, bottom right, there's that picture of Trajan's column I promised earlier. Can't for the life of me remember why I put it here in the presentation, but at the bottom there we see Ister or uh, 
Danubius as the Roman legions cross above him. I'm sure there was something about that, like Bridge to the Underworld or something. It'll come back to me. Um, so the one thing that uh, artists over the last 2,000 years have latched onto when it comes to Rainus is uh, the jar. So while most Potomoy are depicted with amphorae or jugs, Rainus's jar seems to resemble an urn far more than his other counterparts. Near the Rhine Valley lies one of the largest Iron Age burial sites, uh, sites also known as the Rhine Graver. So the Rhine burial place, um, which is just filled with rows and rows of urns. And these date to Proto-Celtic times. Um, so you know, we're talking Bronze Age all the way into early Iron Age. In fact, just last year in 2020, um, the largest intact Rhine grave was ever found. It contained in the center a large urn theorized to hold the ashes of chieftain, and around him, in a spiraling flower shape, were the bodies of six individuals um, who we assume were assigned female at birth, um, and they all had various different grave goods, Alemanni, Saxon, Burgundian, Byzantian, but they all circled this individual. Um, so we can see that it persisted on well into Germanic times. Um, this is also evident with the Saxons and the Alemanni still preferring to uh, cremate their dead um, instead of burying them in burial mounds, like was common for many uh, Germanic peoples. Um, the practice has persisted well past Christianization and has actually repeatedly been condemned by the Catholic Church until just about a year or so. In Germany and Switzerland, it was still illegal to bury urns near the Rhine River up until two or three years ago because people were still doing it. Um, the Swiss German canton of Basel announced in September an official sanction of Rhine burials, permitting citizens to scatter ashes freely in the Rhine. And they did this as a half step because there were several batches of urns discovered in the bottom of Lake Zurich, which flows into the Rhine. Um, they found a grand total of 67 urns um, just between 2010 and 2020. So after this discovery that people were just going to dump the urns in there anyway, they allowed the sprinkling of the ashes into the river. Um, in fact, they've now even provided an alternative. Special funerary cruises on the Rhine and other rivers are often used for this purpose. Mourners honor a loved one's connections to a particular natural animal, uh, element, landmark, or place. The Rhine, nicknamed Father Rhine by locals in the Rhineland region and other bodies of water, hold cultural significance to many peoples. This is from Switzerland's official website for tourism. This, even with Christianization, this habit of putting our dead into the Rhine River has never disappeared. The idea of the Rhine River carrying the dead towards their final resting place in the north is an incredibly old concept and probably coincides with the origin of the, uh, the proto-Celtic people. Um, within other religions, such as uh, Tangrism, which is a steppe religion, um, all peoples are thought to be transported up the river of life to their final resting place. This river is both a physical place as well as the Milky Way itself. And this draws striking parallels to Rhenus being both the river Rhine as well as the Eridanus constellation, the fiery river of stars that leads souls to the next world. Uh, in the Dutch Welsh Sagan, it's a collection of folk tales and god stories represented with an alternate tale of Thor battling Jormungandr. Um, in this story, the serpent is simply called Midgard Slung, um, which means the Midgard snake, and is defeated by Donar, commonly also identified as Hercules Magisanos. Um, that will vary from individual practitioner nowadays, but the common academic stance thereof is that the Hercules Magisanos is a Latin identifier for Donar or vice versa, or that they may be cognates, but that's how scholars are. Um, however, after he defeats the Midgard Slung, um, Donar succumbs to his wounds, um, which causes him to drown in the lake. The ocean gods send 
a big black boat to retrieve. Oh, oh, coming. Pardon me one more second. That's my child again. Be right back. Um, so yeah, within the Welvish Sagan, after Dunar is defeated by the Midgard Slong, and he sinks into the water, the ocean gods, who are unnamed, just called the ocean gods, send a large black boat to retrieve Donar's corpse and to carry it northwards to its final resting place. The fact that this is so different than the Icelandic and uh, Norwegian tellings of the tale may point to a strong uh, continental Gaulish influence within the stories. The Welvish sagas are full of Germanic stories with strong Celtic and Gallo-Roman influences. I highly recommend you check them out if you ever get your hand on a, hands on a translation. They're wonderful. Um, within Theogony, Eridanus welcomes Patheon and carries him into the underworld. We've already talked about this. When Patheon falls down into Eridanus's proverbially open arms, he is said to sink deeper than he has ever sank before. This is quite simply a way for Eridanus to guide Patheon into the underworld. And if we can identify Eridanus and Rhenus, we can assume, based on all our other context clues, that Rhenus might have had a similar function. So that is his, as an underworld god and particularly a guide to the underworld. Um, however, that's not where the underworld uh, association ends. The imagery of this and wine uh, is not particularly attested in mythology, but is a popular part of the artistic interpretation of Father Rhine. As his water has supplied the fields of Germany with many hundreds of, for many hundreds of years, allowing for the production of high quality white wine. Wine itself is a chthonic and commonly associated with gods of the dead and the underworld. Such We see other examples of this in uh, Sichelus, for example, who one of his many functions is god of the underworld, but he also has ties to wine. We also see this too, uh, in connection to the Norse god Othan, who is a death god and is said with the mythological context to, to subsist on wine alone. So this points us again towards a chthonic function. Um, he also is tied to horses, bulls, and sacrifice. The connection with bulls and horses cannot be overlooked, and it is tempting to tie the river gods to the primordial cow or uh, Travos Trigonaris. Sorry, Drunetos, I know I butchered that. Um, but sadly, we have very little evidence to directly tie these together. Um, I do have some modern doxa on that, but I'll hold that for later. Um, Rhenus Pater is also, as we mentioned before, uh, labeled an incredibly wealthy god. Uh, the Rhine is thought of as fabulously wealthy. We found many hordes of gold, votive offerings, coins, bells, belts, sword, daggers, bows, you name it, it's in the Rhine. You can find it. He also has all these treasures of the underworld. Um, and when Eridanus, who is a cognate of Rhenus, attended the marriage of Poseidon, Eridanus brought shining gifts, greatest amber from the trees of the Heliads that trickle riches. Um, we also know from uh, a very, very underwhelming uh, musical trilogy by this guy, Wogner, Wogner, I don't know, whatever, called Lord of the Rings or something. But anyway, um, he talks about the Rhine gold, the specific uh, imagery of that uh, musical opera is the money contained, the riches, the fabulous chthonic wealth of Rhenus Pater. Um, so we also have him as protector and progenitor. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quote from Hesiod again. Um, she, and he's speaking of Tethys, brought forth into a race a part of the daughters, the Oceanids, who with Lord Apollon and the Potomoi have the young in their keeping all over the earth. Like I mentioned before, this is the right that Zeus gave them. It was not uncommon for many Potomoi to be recorded as progenitors of different Greek 
tribes. Oftentimes, um, the tribes would be named after the river. And we even see a Germanic example of this earlier with the Istavones and Isser. Um, there is also a, uh, later on, um, a, a Frankish concept of this. Um, within Frankish mythology, a quintor attacks Claudius's wife while she's bathing. Now, a quintor is half merman, half bull. All of these are qualities of the Potomoy. He's just a little less light on the man side. But we have seen that the depictions vary in theme. Um, this is actually what fathers the Frankish chief Merovius. Oh, wow, I went out of it. Give me two seconds. Oh, wonderful. So this is actually what fathers uh, Merovius, uh, though in later folklore, and my personal interpretation of this, is that this could be a retelling of the Frankish origin myths of the Istavilns. So perhaps assigning the progenitor role to either Rhenus or Ister, and sometimes they're identified as the same due to their large uh, overlapping tendencies and domains. Um, all right, so the next one would be baby proofing or baby tempering. This is something I'm sure most of you are familiar with, at least in a passing sense, but uh, Tacitus does record that both the Gauls and the Germans living on the bank of the Rhine would take infants and submerge them into the water. And according to Tacitus, this was done in order to test the uh, virility of the child and also to see if it was conceived within wedlock. Um, I don't know if you ever asked anyone about this. Um, those two things um, seem rather strange, but either way, we do have evidence of children being submerged into the Rhine River. Um, could it be that there was a different reason they were subsumed? Um, was it perhaps a ritual to strengthen the child? Was it really something as simple as checking to see if not it was a product of an affair? Um, perhaps the idea was that if the uh, child was a descendant of the tribe, descended from the river god, that the river god would not kill it, but acknowledge it. Um, I personally don't think any of those. Um, I follow the blueprints of the idea of Rhenus being a death god, as well as having strong ties as an adoptive parent. By submerging the child within the water, it was symbolically killed and was now free to be adopted by Rhenus Pater. Perhaps this was granted him extraordinary powers or elevated his social status, but it was likely done to incentivize the continued support and protection from the child, uh, for the child from the river god. Um, in regards to his female progeny, Rhenus is thought to be the father of rivers and nymphs. Uh, when it comes to his male children, they're oftentimes less impressive, um, but they just happen to be uh, mortal men who are a little bit tough. Um, the most famous example of this we have is of a, a Gallo-Germanic uh, chieftain called Vidramarus, also known as Britomarus, also known as Viridramus. Um, and he is the chief of a tribe that was an offshoot of the uh, Edwe, Edwe, wow, A-E-D-U-I. Yeah, I'm butchering that one. But he was definitely of Gallo-Germanic stock. We know this, that um, he had a Gaulish name, but in a uh, Germanic structure. Nevertheless, he was a Gaulish chieftain. And Marshall writes about this, and he gives us this report. He says, as Vidramaris in his striped pants attacked, throwing spears before the battle line, the collar, his torque, fell from his sliced throat. Before his defeat in battle, he had apparently scoffed at his Roman's opponents, exclaiming that he could not be killed, for he had been born of the Rhine himself. Was Vidramaris speaking of a lineage? Did he descend from the tribes, descended from the Rhine, or could it be that Vidramaris himself underwent the baby proofing ad adoption ritual and once donated his hair to the very same god? That's a big part of the river worship and Potomoy is the donation of hair. When a young, mostly male, child came of age or when a hero returned from journey, they would cut their hair in reverence of the river. We find 
to this day in material finds um, among the Alemanni belts with ornate belt buckles within are concealed strands of hair. Are these votive offerings? Are they protective charms? We don't know, but there could be a loose connection to the river and the worship of Renus Pater. Now within the Swiss saga of Lorelei, we have evidence of Renus Pater acting as an escort to the dead, as well as an example of a doctrine. The omen is prayed by her love, and as the old, he flings himself from a high cliff in the Rhine, but not before offering some pearls. In exchange, Rainus seemingly welcomes her among his children, and she makes fre frequent appearances in folklore, though from that point forward, she is always depicted as a siren or a mermaid. So, and this is the exact quote, she dropped the pearls that hung around her neck into the depths of the water, awaiting a chariot to come. When it did, it drove her away into the deep depths of the sea to never be seen again. Rumor has it that a distant murmur of her song can be heard around the rock. Rhenus, in this regard, also has some similarities to the continental Germanic god Wait, Wade, or Wada, a ferryman who brings his son Weolent, Norse Volant, to study with the god Mimir at the well of the world tree. There's an exact quote from the Hildebrand's lead discussing Wade, where it says, we may say that with Wade, all creatures and men who fell became elves or adders or nickers who live in the pools, all but one man, one man, Hildebrand. Again, we see this theme of water deities adopting those that perish within their assigned body of water. Uh, later on, in a different story, we meet Lorelei again. And at this point, she is surrounded by uh, a nobleman, a baron, a group of guards after she had caused his son to crash on rocks and sink due to her beautiful and enchanting voice. Um, now Lorelei says, the Rhine is coming for me, she called. She bent over the precipice, tore the pearls from her head and hurled them into the water. She began to sing. Father dear, send forth thy steeds from waters clear, and I shall ride with the waves and the wind. The idea of Rhenus as a father god has survived into modern times. He has been made patron of multiple shooting festivals in Germany and was chosen over various Catholic saints to be the, pre to be the uh, presiding uh, individual over folk festivals. Poets of the 17th century identify themselves as sons of the Rhine. And uh, as I said, within that uh, absolutely terrible and very, very nationalist and all around bad opera cycle, The Lord of the Rings, um, we do gain glimpses of Rhenus Pater. Um, his daughters, the titular Rhine maidens, stay, uh, repeatedly say, you know what father says. Father has warned us. Despite Rhenus Pater not featuring within the ring cycle, um, he is nevertheless present in the background. Um, we also have Rhenus Pater as an oath god. Um, we know that much of what Rhenus oh, was invoked for was oaths, just like Danubius. Um, he's responsible for the revenge of the breaking of oaths. Much of the history around Rhenus has involved military crossings on the river. The Germanoi, the Gauls, the Romans, as well as the Huns later on, crossed the Rhine to wage war. Oftentimes, by contemporary Romans, this was interpreted as a revenge. Um, and what's interesting to note is that most of these crossings um, involve the Romans actually breaking uh, oaths they had made to these other people. They stopped paying Attila. Attila invaded. They promised... Uh, sanctity to the goths they did not deliver the the goths crossed the rhine and they fought um so oftentimes this comes directly as a consequence of a breaking of oaths um the rhine is notorious for rapid unpredictable swelling and floods that are often unforeseen and result in mass damage and cat and casualty um the theme of the Rhine as a revenge god is also present within folklore. A notable example of this is the legend of the two brothers. Legend has it that there once were two brothers whose castles, Liebenstein and Sternberg, rested on neighboring hilltops. They fell in love with the same siren named Angela. <laughs> yes, very, very 
very, very Gaulish name, Angela, who despite being drawn to the elder brother, made a promise to stay true to the younger as he went to battle. When he returned, triumphant from the war, he had on his arm a Greek bride. Driven to despair at the breaking of his oath, Angela died celibate. The two brothers became bitter enemies and they each died at the hands of the other. Again, revenge for broken oaths. There's also the legend of Hatto, who was a Catholic priest who was enamored with the Rhine and actually moved into an old Roman ruin, rebuilt it with taxpayer dollars, lived in it like a king. And as a consequence of his frivolous spending habits, um, his constituents, or better said, the common folk began to get hungry. So he promised them all a meal. He rounded them up into the courtyard of the tower and lit it aflame. And as they all went up into flame, he laughed and said, oh, what a good bonfire this makes. The legend goes the next day as he was perusing the courtyard, taking in the death, uh, all of the corpses from his war crime, um, that hundreds and hundreds of rats burst forth from the corpses of the dead and uh, pursued him. He fled out of his castle to a different castle, uh, which was a large, large tower, but the rats pursued and scaled the tower and subsequently ate him. Um, within folklore, rats are oftentimes symbolic of uh, the souls of the deceased. And so again, there we have the souls of the deceased coming to take revenge on a oath that was made and broken in the vicinity of the Rhine. Um, my absolute favorite folklore, and then we'll leave it be, is um, an article from the Gelderlander, which was a uh, magazine, and it mentions an interesting legend about Castle Dornwith. A long time ago, the castle belonged to a nobleman named Berend who worshipped the Rhine god. One day, a monk came and asked Berend if he could build a Christian chapel on Berend's land. Berend hesitated because he knew the Rhine god would see it as an insult and a violation of his vow, but eventually he gave his permission. However, the Rhine god was very angry that Berend had turned his back on him, and as revenge, he caused Berend's beautiful wife to drown in the Rhine. Berend was torn by grief, and he started living like a hermit in his castle. Late one evening, when Berend was drunk, he kissed a woman who had come to visit, which made the knight and her husband very angry and he challenged Bertrand to a duel. Suddenly, a flash of lightning caused the knight to become distracted, and Berend used the opportunity to kill him with a dishonorable sword strike. After the knight's wife and the rest of the travelers left the castle. From that day on, Berend was haunted by fears, and at night he often awoke and saw the knight's wife laying next to him in bed with a bloody sword between them. After his death, Go and go, he said, to Rome Nestleville. Variations of Baron's myth are present in all folklore compendiums from the neighborhood uh, from, where, of the castle. If this is to be believed, if there is any grain of truth to it, and Baron did indeed, indeed worship Rainus Pater, that would make Rainus Pater the longest worshipped pagan god within continental Europe, at least in and around the Rhine area, um, because Baron was lord of the castle in 1206. And again, we see that theme, that punishing a violation of vows. Um, like I said, there is some uh, overlap. Um, between Earth Shaker Poseidon, which I've hinted on earlier, and Rhenus Pater. And a lot of that really boils down to the domain um, being Catholic, being of roots, but also earthquakes, because the Rhine sits on a tectonic um, fault line. In the 12th century, um, there was a huge earthquake that killed thousands of people and actually demolished the bishop. Uh, the bishop's seat in Basel, Switzerland. And this was murmured by the people to be a direct um, result of angering the Rhine River. Um, so again, we see that violation, that anger, but this time tied to earthquakes, as well as the chariot of Lorelei and the bull associations um, lead to some cross-domain coloring between Earthquaker Poseidon and Uranus.
um, which I believe is the result of the Greeks and the Gauls having cultural exchange since way, way back. All right, so we've arrived at the, uh, towards the end. I have hope I've given you a in-depth uh, history, um, cult, uh, folklore, a little bit of everything for uh, Rainus Pater. I'm gonna talk a little bit about his role in my praxis. Thank you for bearing with me as I uh, father through this. And uh, yeah, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. As an Alemanni, I draw from Gaulish, Roman, and Germanic sources from and around the Rhine River. As such, Rhenus Pater has a huge place within my presence. We have documented secondhand accounts that the Alemanni, in crossing of the Rhine River in the 400s, offered 20 white horses to the river, just as they would again later while crossing the Po River in Italy. When speaking of the Alemanni, it was written that they were indistinguishable from their Frankish overlords, with the exception that they offered to certain hills, streams, and rivers. With his ties to the underworld, the herons, and a similar domain overlap to Poseidon, I view his, him as being the Gallo-Roman interpretation of the Gaulish god Rhenos, an aspect of the god of the well at the roots of the world tree. I believe the well god and all the rivers full pouring from him are results of the blood spilling from the neck of Travos Trigonaris, the twin of Manu within the primordial Proto-Indo-European twin motif. So two twins, one man, one, one bull, the bull is slain, and the three herons represent the three gods that make the world out of him. His blood becomes the well sitting at the roots of the world tree from which all Potomoy pull, uh, pour forth. The well god nourishes the roots and spills forth into many different streams who are all on their own independent deities, but also not. They can freely break apart and reform as much as the well god and the well itself. Water can never be permanently separated. These rivers can lead up from that world into the next. Physically, such as in burials or sea, or metaphysically, such as in the travels of the souls along Eridanus, or the sailing of the human remains along the Rhine. They are not the only entrance to the other world, but definitely a surefire one. Think of it like a highway to the afterlife, is how I envision it. Envision it. A highway to the great feasting hall in the other world. Of all these rivers, Rhenus is the strongest and ruler over the others. Ovid calls him king of all rivers, why he has also been named father of all rivers. He is therefore a god of the underworld and ruler of all rivers within it. He has many rivers, from one being Moel, which is still in the Rhine uh, Romantic era. Oftentimes they are depicted together as a couple, but another partner of his would be Nehellenia, whose inscriptions have been found exactly on the same route as Rhenus is. Um, in my experience, Rhenus Pater is a very passive god. Um, this is probably something he inherits from his cognates, like Eridanus's father, Oceanus, who, who took part in neither the conflict between the Titans nor the conflict between the Titans and the gods. I think it is particularly because of the constant nature of water. Um, just like in Norse mythology, Aegir, the giant of the sea is depicted as a very passive force. Um, I think this is partially because of the constant nature. I mean, it, water was here before us, and it will be here after everything. Rhenus is a warm, supportive, and comforting uh, deity. He is like whole body hugs. If any of you play Dungeons and Dragons out there, um, Rhenus is he's a cleric is someone who supports and strengthens you and can unleash a terrible fury if angered. Um, it's not going to be the head of the point. Um, I found from uh, hierophantic experiences that a lot of my developments with Rhenus were actually me being led to him by other gods. Um, very rarely was it a direct contact. Um, nevertheless, I found personally that material offerings um, buried within the ground or deposited into moving water, as well as cooked meals of pork, chicken, earth vegetables, grains, beets, roots, 
wine and beer have all proven very successful. That's just my experience. Your mileage may vary. Um, in meditation um, on death and the stars, I have come to closer understanding, just contemplating the natures. And again, when I deal with uh, Rainus, it's always a soft, warm, comforting feeling on the back of the head. It is not so much direct words. It's very subtle. Um, I, I think that uh, the closest thing to uh, what I could describe him as is uh, like a best friend who's far, far away and waiting for the day I come home to visit him in his great hall at the entrance to the other world. Until then, he'll gladly support me, protect me, and strengthen me to accomplish my goals. Um, if you've been interested by any of this, I highly recommend you uh, check out Rainus um, as well as his other cognates and the other Potomoy. Um, I think that those can be very, very rewarding experiences if you are so uh, inclined. Um, like I said, um, if we had the time, we would do a ritual. Um, I took the liberty of going up a little bit because I had to stop a few times on account of my child. Um, I think we're getting pretty close to the end, so I will hold off the ritual. Um, I'll probably just film it and we can put it in the, the Discord for some other times. But if there are any questions, I will now check for the first time.